All right. For the Bible study exercise, we have been looking at discernment now for almost seven weeks, right at seven weeks. We re- technically have a week to go. Um, and I'm just going to do a quick reminder of what we've done if you have been participating. If you have not, then well, I'll try to catch you up. Uh, we started off by looking at the subject of discernment, by looking at the fact that discernment uh, comes from the word of God, right? It's the word of God that is the basis of us discerning what we should or shouldn't do, what is right and what is wrong. And we looked in Genesis chapter 3, right? Now, if you would think, you would think that in a roundabout way, if we, if we realize, okay, it's God's word, God's word tells us what we should and shouldn't do, we have to discern what it means by study, by interpretation, and then we have to then uh, seek to apply what it says to all situations, and then we decide what we can and can't do. Now, I wish it was as simple as discerning what is right and wrong, and then we would just immediately do right and wrong, but discerning it is far different than doing it, yes? Because what, what impacts the doing, what, what, what impacts us taking discernment and putting it in, into action? What's the thing that causes problems with our discernment leading to the right action? Sin nature, right? We got something working against it, right? We can discern with our mind what the Bible says, but we have something in us that says what? I don't care what it says. I, I don't want to do that, right? So, so we understand that. And that discernment can also, or that sin nature can also impact what? Our discerning, because if your nature says, I want to do it, what do we have immediately a tendency to do? To change, to we, we change what it says, and we try to find a loophole, and we try to justify it, right? So we, so, but it's the Word of God. And we looked at Genesis 3. We looked at that entire situation. Yes? Okay. Now, if you remember, the curriculum took a different path, right? I, I was giving us one path, and the curriculum was giving another. My path is discernment then is based on God's Word. We have to read it and study it and learn to apply it, Right? And we got to know how to apply that discernment in every situation to the best of our ability. And where the word of God is not explicit, all we can do is take the principles and apply it to it, but we cannot go beyond it, right? Does that make sense? Right? Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, yes? So that's kind of where I wanted to leave it. But the curriculum took a different approach that's probably very common in the evangelical world. Does everyone remember kind of the approach the curriculum took? Even if you didn't look at the curriculum, I've obviously have articulated it about a zillion times. But if you haven't, or if you missed something I've done, let me try to explain. They took kind of the approach like this. Well, yes, of course you have the Bible. Of course. Of course. But when it comes to discerning what God's will is or what God wants, you have to have these other principles that you try to apply to every situation. And does everybody remember what those principles were? Okay, all right. No, all right, here we go. The the first one was conviction. That was in Acts chapter 2. Remember how that was applied? All right, that was applied in this way. It was applied in in, in the following way. So now, I've got God's word, but now, okay, I'm gonna choose to do this. Is it right or is it wrong? Does it lead to conviction? If I'm convicted, then I shouldn't do it. Remember, that was their principle? And what was the problem with that principle? Subjective, Subjective, because sometimes you're convicted about doing something that the Scriptures doesn't actually condemn, but you were taught that it was wrong, even though the Scriptures doesn't condemn it, right? Or the Scriptures may condemn it, but you don't feel convicted by it. Your conviction is a subjective thing. What, what, what matters? What does God's word say? That's what matters. Not your feelings. Conviction is a subjective feeling, is it not? I mean, there's probably things you do that you don't feel convicted by, and other people, if they did it, they would feel convicted by it. Why is there a difference in con- conviction levels? Well, then you can get into all kinds of trying to figure that out. All that matters is what God's word has to say. Then the next one was faith. Hebrews 11. Remember how that worked? How do you decide what to do? Remember how the curriculum handled it? No, the curriculum handled it by saying you choose which requires more faith. Whatever requires more faith has to be what God would want. What's the problem with that? 
Well, not how you measure it, but just because something requires more faith doesn't necessarily mean that's what God is calling you to do. Remember, I gave the example of all the people I went to my first Bible Institute with and, the, and that church told them all they needed to get out of the military because getting out of the military required more faith than following this, having all of the security that comes from it. They all got out because they were going to go into the ministry and they ended up having to have three jobs to support their family. And I think only two of us made it to the ministry and one of us was me and I stayed in the military. See, that, that just because one requires more faith doesn't necessarily mean that's the right path. That's just a, just a subjective, it sounds so spiritual and everybody in the pew would be like, yeah, okay, what requires more faith? Okay, what requires more faith? Well, it would require more faith to give $5,000 to the church versus 10. That doesn't mean that's the right thing to do because you may not then be able to buy your family food or pay your rent, right? Does that make sense? Just saying what requires more faith doesn't always make something right. And sometimes people perceive that one thing requires more faith. For example, some people believe for some weird reason it requires more faith to believe that you can be healed. But I I believe that that doesn't require, you know what requires more faith? Trusting in God when you're not. That requires more faith. Does it make sense? doesn't require more faith to believe that God will work it out the way you want it to. requires more faith when God doesn't work it out the way you want to. But it's just a, it's such a subjective thing. Next, was, was that, that was in uh, Hebrews 11. The next was Exodus 34, where we have God's character, right? Remember we talked about, well, I don't know if y'all, y'all heard, but we talked about this on the podcast, right? God's character then is this. Okay, you choose based on what's consistent with God's character. But again, that can be so subjective, right? Because you can get three people and go, okay, it's Friday night. Let's go do this. And someone will be like, well, that's not consistent with God's character. And someone else would be like, I don't think it's a problem. Meaning it's once again, subjective. So what should we go back and base it on? What does scripture say you can or cannot do that's clear? All of this subjectiveness just be... You know what I hate about the subjectiveness? Those with the authority use it to control and tell people what they can and can't do based off their own, their own decision. Right? Their own discretion, their own, their own discernment. No, it's what scriptures say dogmatically. If the scriptures don't dogmatically say something, we have to admit that, yes? All right. So, so what were all of those? What was the first one? Discernment, it comes from God's word, and then they, they think that you, we need all of these other things. Conviction, faith, and character. And that brings us to the one for today. Now, we're going to go a couple of directions here with this, and I'm going to have to talk about something that's extremely, it's going to be controversial, okay? And I know I should avoid it. I know everything in me tells me I should avoid it. But as soon as something tells me I should avoid it, what do I have a tendency to do? Not avoid it, all right? So I, I find it interesting that we've been studying discernment now for almost seven weeks. I've tried to approach it from every way possible. For those online who participate in the Bible study exercise, they're doing a word study on discernment, so they've definitely dug in. So, uh, so for those online, keep do it, finish up your word study because you've got like a week to get it done before we move on to the next Bible study exercise. But so people are doing the word study. We've used the curriculum, which gives a completely different approach. And then I've given my approach. So those who are participating have had really three different ways to look at this very important subject. But something has happened inside the world of Christianity <laughs> that really fits with discernment. All right? And the whole world and all the world of Christianity has done nonstop fighting about it and fighting about it and fighting about it. And fighting. If I if I get another email about it, I may scream. I may I may start drinking heavily because I, I'm tired of hearing about it. I've been talking. I, t- I started talking about it right from the beginning. I think I've done a very good job of addressing it. I'm ready to move on. The rest of the world is not ready to move on. And nobody can seem to agree. Now, if nobody can agree, then we have something that requires what? Discernment. There we go. See how it fits. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? 
Okay, good. At least one person knows what's going on in the world of Christianity. The rest of the church is like, ah, we don't know what Christianity is. Okay, the Asbury Revival. The whole world is nonstop talking about it over and over and over. If you don't know, Asbury is a university in Kentucky. And supposedly revival broke out, I think, was it last Wednesday? Okay, and, uh, and uh, well, the, the whole world is going there. People from all over the world is coming there to supposedly experience it. And everyone has their uh, strong opinions about it, okay? I think uh, Chris Rosebro from Fighting for the Faith, if you find him on YouTube, his, uh, uh, his YouTube video is probably one of the best on it. Um, he's done a very, very good job already reviewing some of the audio because uh, he does a really good job. Um, I, my, uh, what I have done so far is I did an initial podcast about it, and then I, I reviewed the sermon that supposedly led to the revival. I reviewed the entire sermon. So I, I've, I've already spent probably almost two hours, maybe three hours on the subject, um, and I, I, I thought I was done with it. But everybody's fighting, fighting about it, all right? Now, everyone has opinions on it. And if I listen, and I'm not, look, whatever your opinion, opinions are, I'm not here to get into any argument or fight with anybody, but here's what I would challenge everyone to do about discernment. When I hear people talk about it, I'm hearing words like, they talk something about feelings or emotions or how they perceive it. And those become what kind, those are terms that are very much connected with what way of thinking a subjective way of thinking. And that goes right back to discernment, right? Goes right back to discernment. We don't judge things on how it feels. We don't judge things on what we see. We don't judge things based off, we've got to judge things from a Christian perspective in a a way that is more objective. That's the whole thing with discernment, right? We have to, so I'll give you some objective facts, all right? Asbury University is a Christian university founded on what theological principle? This is objective. This is not even subjective. The Wesleyan holiness movement. Now, as soon as you hear the Wesleyan holiness movement, you should immediately do what? You should discern. Because Wesleyanist holiness teaches what? They call it entire sanctification, meaning that once you experience this, you can be sinless perfection. That's an objective thing, right? Like when people were arguing with me, I was like, it's on the website, okay? It's on the web. I'm like looking on alive on the air. I'm like, I'm on the website. Osbury University. Wesley, its foundation is Wesleyan holiness. And I'm like, just look up what that means. Like I worked with someone who was Wesleyan holiness and I I wasn't a very good person. I wasn't a very good person because I asked her if she had reached her entire sanctification and she told me yes. And so then I tried to irritate her every day so that she would get mad. And when she got mad, I would be like, your sanctification is not working out for you. So I know that was not very godly. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not even pretending that it was godly, but I would bother her and provoke and provoke and provoke and provoke and provoke and then be like, well, what happened to your entire sanctification? Because every time you work with me, it doesn't seem to work. Okay. okay I, so, yeah, I guess. So that's a serious thing. Second serious thing, Todd Bentley went. Everybody know who Todd Bentley is, right? Do y'all, do, y'all, do, y'all, are, do y'all even know what's happening in the world? Okay. He was the guy with the Lakeland revival. Remember that mess? That supposedly people were being raised from the dead by listening to the broadcast. Remember when Jesus was going to appear on stage and I told everyone it was a Sunday night here and I'm like, okay, everyone go home. I'm watching it live. I pop popcorn because Jesus was going to show up. Guess what? He didn't show up. Right? Some go so far to say Todd Bentley is basically demon-possessed. I wouldn't go that far, but he's definitely a heretic. Well, he showed up and said it's a mighty move of God. That's making me a little worried. Right? And then, there's a, and then there's other objective issues, right? There's other objective issues. Like, how do you define revival? 
What, what's an objective biblical definition of revival? What is an objective? De- that's, that's an objective fact, right? What is it, right? What is it? What does it look like? Is it 18 hours of singing? What is it? Does that, does that, does that, I'm not, I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm not saying that in a sarcastic way. What is it? Okay, so in other words, there's objective things about it, right? Do I have to go there to experience it? Like, is revival happen in a place? Is it geographically located? And like, if I'm here, I can't. But if I walk into the build, building, all of a sudden now I feel it? That's very subjective. You've got other things like the, the, the very initial news reports. We're like, you know, this girl talking that she got ready to go to class and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit told her not to go to class, but to go back. Okay, now that's extra biblical revelation. Now I say, I'm already starting to see a lot of issues, right? And I heard a lot. God told me this and God told me. Well, now, okay, very charismatic stuff. Don't, that is very objective, right? Now, when I say that, people are like, oh, you're just mean and you just... Ha-. No, you know what? For every young person there, I hope and pray that something awesome is happening and I hope something great can occur. I, sometimes what happens, something can start off good and then it can get hijacked later on because once it went viral on social media, then we know what it happens, right? Then it, then it takes on a life all of its own, right? Now it's like, is it God-driven or is it... Social media driven, right? Like that, that, like that. But that's, that's a subjective, that's a subjective argument, right? That's not an objective issue. So, but, but it's requiring discernment. What's driving me crazy is nobody can agree. It's either this is amazing or this is basically Satan. Now, all, all the people on both sides are both what? Christians all using what? Does that not make you want to just throw up your hands and go, I give up. I, can't, I give up. Now, why, why, why is that a problem? Because guess what? Our discernment, no matter how much we want to say, not a lot of our discernment is not based off what? Scripture alone. What, what influences our discernment? Let's go through it. Bobby said it first. Feelings. Unless you, we can't deny that. Feelings. Feelings will, will beat out discernment every single time. Feelings will control your discernment, drive your discernment. What you feel, man, your feelings, <laughs> you're in trouble, man. Your feelings, like you're, you, you, that, that you can't let the feelings drive the train. You're, go, you're gonna go off the tracks, over the cliff. It, it, it doesn't work. You gotta have facts. You gotta have truth. There's gotta be something objective. In, in your, forget Christianity, even in your own life. Feelings will lead you into a dark, 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 dark place. And, it will, and you'll have a hard time finding your way back out of that dark place. Feelings are misleading. They, they lie. They, you can't go with that. Christians should know that. Right? Eve felt that it, the tree was great. Her feelings were wrong. <laughs> okay? Does that make sense? Right? What are other things that impact your discernment? We have feelings. Culture, yeah, the culture you live, right? It, what, and that culture can be the culture at large. It can just be the culture you're, you're in, the culture you're raised in that can determine how you feel about something. And it's like it may not have any be, be objectively right, biblically speaking. What else? You have culture. Well, it, th- that should be what determines our discernment, but let's be honest, that doesn't do, uh, obviously that doesn't happen, <laughs> okay? I, 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 don't, I don't know if that ever really happens in any meaningful way. It should. Uh, other things? We got feelings, we got culture. Okay. okay. What? Okay, oh, well, said nature. Okay, obviously that's going to have an impact on our discernment, okay? What else? Friends? Friends, Family? Right? Friends and family can have a major impact on how you think about things. Right? I mean, not me, but maybe you, okay? But yeah, depend. I mean, the closer you are to family and the more, some people like friends and family are massively influential upon them. Others of us are like, whatever, okay, yeah. No, I, no, no, okay. I moved on past that a long time ago, okay, right? Does that make sense? You've got all of these things coming on you, Right? And that can, that can greatly determine how you perceive something. 
And we have to realize that. We have to realize that. So I just think it's interesting that right now we're watching discernment take place and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I've been Christian long enough. I've heard about revival about a bazillion times and a bazillion times I've heard of it and a bazillion times the, the end result is not near what everyone claimed it was going to be, right? So I kind of sit back and patiently wait. Do I hope for the best? Absolutely, right, absolutely. Do I, but guess what? I have to look at it in what way? Objectively, right? Objectively, I have to look at it. Objectively, objectively. Does that make sense? It must be an objective thing. Cannot be subjective. So all I ask is, if you're, if you're looking at it this week, this week or ever how long it goes, just objectively, don't get caught up in the hype. Don't get caught up in all of that because that goes against discernment. Now, the curriculum today wants us to look at discernment from a very interesting perspective, and I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but we're going to look at it. All right, if you have the Trinity hymnal, turn to page 869. We're not going to get far with this, but I wanted to at least deal with the other quickly. 869. The Trinity Hymnal, 869. And what do you find when you get there? The Shorter Catechism. Oh, we love the Catechism. In this church, we like the Puritan Catechism, but this is, the Puritan Catechism is based off this Catechism. And everyone knows, every child in the world, everyone should know question number one, right? What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. When we say the chief end, what do we mean? Okay, what is our purpose in life? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Does that sound good? Does that sound wonderful? Now, the curriculum, this is what they want us to do. They believe that not only do we need conviction, not only do we need faith, not only do we need God's character to figure out what we should do, we need to have this in mind, what will glorify God? God. That sounds good, does it not? It sounds good. Now, but once again, this becomes what? Becomes so subjective. So subjective. I wish it wasn't, but it is. So let me ask you this. So let's start with this question. Let's go with this fundamental question. What does it mean to glorify God? How does one glorify God? And you're going to think everyone answers this the same way. They don't. So tell me, how do do you glorify God? Okay, all right. So, okay, y'all going straight with the action. Action, how you live is how you glorify God. That's where y'all are immediately going. Okay, all right. So y'all going with action, what you do. A certain action glorifies God, and a certain action doesn't glorify God. Right? Is that, is that the way you're, you're approaching it? Okay. Now, just so you know, not everyone would approach it necessarily from that perspective. Okay? But let's go with that. Let's work that out. That's, is, does that sound good? Does it preach good? Can you get a lot of people convicted that they feel really bad? Because I can constantly try to demonstrate how you don't glorify God, right? Do you think you ever glorified God anywhere close to correct? Now, we all know we all fall short. Yes, we, we all know that, okay? But what makes it difficult in this being carried out in a practical way? What makes it difficult? Two, well, no, two, the, 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 the difficulty I'm looking for is that no two people would agree on which action does or doesn't glorify God. I'll give you an example. I, I, I've used these, I used, just used this last night on the podcast, but I got to use what I know, right? Because that, I got to go with what I've experienced, right? So for example, let's say my, my first church in, or not, well, I guess not my technically my first church, but the church that I was at for, for over t- almost 10 years in Nebraska, the one I went to Bible, St- Bible Institute in my first church I was ordained in, their, their view on what glorifies God was at times conflicting and confusing. All right. So, for example, if if it's really weird, if you went to the movie theater, that was not glorifying to God. If you went to Blockbuster, 
and rented movies, that was. If you watched secular television, that was glorifying to God. Listening to secular music wasn't. You could watch college football all day. You were glorifying God. If you were listening to music, you weren't. And I could go on and on and on and on and on and on. And it was like, I don't understand how this works. Why is it everything you like to do glorifies God and everything I like to do doesn't? That's the way I felt. Because everything I like to do was clearly I was in opposition to them, right? Because, you know, me and my music, right? The way I am with music, right? So I was constantly like, how? This is not working here. Now, those are, everyone there has this but nobody can agree on which action does or doesn't glorify God. That, don't you see a problem? Now, if we, if we were very honest about like which, which actions glorify God, what do, what do you think your life would look like if you were really committed to like, I'm only going to do actions that supposedly glorify God. What do you think that would look like? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Prayer. Prayer. Reading the Bible. Monastery. Okay. Mr. Gullet, just like, why are we listing things? <laughs> Let's just call it what it is. You would be in a monastery. Just live in a monastery. Without Wi-Fi, right? Now, we, we, we all know that. We all know that, but then we find ourselves into this trap, like, which glor- does this glorify God? Does this glorify God? Does this glorify God? Does this glorify God? That, and a lot of times, we don't, like, if we're honest, we don't even think about it, right? We just go through actions we don't even think. But you know that if it was true. Like, I, my, I've talked about my friend in Nebraska who was, uh, like, uh, he was the best man at my wedding. Like, I mean, his Christianity, his view was all entertainment is wrong. He would not even come over to my house to even eat if there was not a promise that we would do Bible study after because that would just be entertainment. Nothing. nothing no entertainment. He's like, well, aren't we supposed to live to glorify God? How do you argue that? If you, if you, if, right? So then, so then the issue is, well, wait a minute. Is that a correct way of understanding it? I mean, if that, that sound, it preaches good, right? Like it gets you through the sermon. We, we can look at some scriptures. Let's go through these quickly because you know a bunch of these. We'll go through a bunch really, really fast, all right? Because we're, we started so late, but that's okay. We know 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Everyone look it up really quick. We know this one, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Everyone knows this one. First Corinthians 10, 31. What does it say? Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Wow, that sounds pretty good, right? Yes? I think, everyone, I think everyone agrees that that sounds, that sounds really good. Uh, how about, um, I, got, I got different translations. Well, go to 1 Corinthians 6.20. We'll just look at two. I got like 20 verses here, but we don't have time. 1 Corinthians 6.20. Everybody see 1 Corinthians 6.20? What does it tell you to do? Yeah, you have been bought with a, you've been bought with a price, right? Because you've been bought with a price, what should you do? Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Glorify God in every and every aspect of your being, inwardly and outwardly. Glorify God. Now, uh, this turns into a lot of focus on what you do. Now, I'll, I'll just show you how uh, some approach it differently. Here's an article. What does it mean to glorify God? To glorify God, this is how they define it, ready? Is to honor him with praise and worship. They don't define it by our actions, but by praise and worship. That's a radically different approach. Now that one's a a little bit more objective and easier to to maintain, right? We We can kind of wrap our arms around that one, right? So, like, let's say, how would I glorify God then in eating and drinking? Well, I would eat and drink, praising and honoring God for providing 
the sustenance for, for providing the meal, right? I'm, I'm giving honor. God, you're sovereign. You provide. I praise and I thank you for it. Praising God in my body and in my spirit is to praise God outwardly, thanking God, and inwardly my heart is connected with that praise and worship because you can praise God with your lips and your heart be far from him. We've all done that in church, right? Right? So that would be a little easier to maintain, right? That would be, I, that would, wouldn't that be wonderful if that, I, I, I'm not saying that that's the right way to handle it, but it would, I can at least grab on to that one, right? I can go like, okay, I can ensure that I am praising and worshiping and thanking God for, daily in my life. I can do that. But, if I, but I, what I want you to see is trying to make it a principle for discernment, as good as it sounds, it has major problems. Because I could bring a list of things right now of what, of what, of things, say things I like to do. And I could pass out that list and say, you put either a check or an X. If it's a check, it glorifies God. If it's an X, it doesn't. What do you think? What do you think? You think there would be agreement? There would not be agreement. You think there would be? Okay, yeah, yeah, no, there wouldn't be. There wouldn't be agreement. Now, what, why wouldn't there be agreement? Like, for example, I'll just give you one. I'll take everyone off, right? I'll take everyone off on this, right? Okay? Sunday afternoon. Some of you like to do a certain activity on Sunday afternoons. We all like to nap. And you think that that's not God's I, I think what in the world? So you're going to take God's day and you're going to use it to sleep so you feel better. Right? Okay? Now you justify it by saying it's a day of rest, right? And I would say, but, right? so, but I don't know if he took a nap. <laughs> I don't know if re- uh, he rested by ceasing from his work. So the rest is to rest from the work so you can dedicate the day to God. Okay, right? I, I, I could, I could, I could, I, I could argue the other way as well. It's to cease from your work so that you can focus on the worship of God. You know, since nobody can get all that Bible study done Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon would be a good time to make up for where you're behind, right? But okay, I, I digress, right? I digress. So, but I'm saying I could argue from a scriptural point. We would all quote scripture. We would all quote scripture. We would all feel justified and you would say, you're glorifying God, and I would have a different perspective. So, see, saying to glorify God is not as easy as it sounds. That's the point I want you to make. So, what, what I'm trying to show you is that all of these ideas on how to discern are so subjective. They, we preach them as objective, but in practice they become subjective. That's what I want you to realize. It, it, wouldn't it be simple that like whatever the issue is, right? Here's, here's the issue. And I'm like, okay, Christians, here's what we need to discern today. Go. Now, when it's over, guess what we're going to get? 50 different answers. So that means we have to find a way to discern. That's, and I'm trying to argue for an easier way to discern, right? So let's, let's take the nap issue. Let's take the nap issue, right? Because I don't understand why anybody would want to take a nap. makes no sense to me. I don't even know why anybody would ever want to sleep, okay? Sleep is the practice of death. I don't need practice, okay? I don't need practice, right? I don't need practice. That's all you're doing. When you go to sleep, you're practicing to die. That's all you're practicing to do. Your heart slows down, everything, okay? Okay? No, 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 no. You're practicing death, okay? Right? <laughs> so we're already going to get disagreement. We're already going to get disagreement. But I don't understand. Like, I don't understand sleep. I don't understand it. It's the weirdest thing. Like, who created this nonsense, right? Because when you're laying in your deathbed, nobody's going to be like, oh, I wish I would have slept a little more, right? Nobody's going to do that. You know that. Okay, right? Nobody, I, I'm going to be like, <laughs> yeah, I got two lifetimes in for your one. Okay, that's what I'm going to say. Okay, all right. So, but you get the idea. If we, if we take that, there's going to be arguing, right? There's going to be arguing. So, what can we objectively say from Scripture in regards to taking a nap on a Sunday? There's no prohibition against. 
There's no specific prohibition. Oh, we could argue how you define the Sabbath. You could argue how binding. Now it gets into arguments about, is it even binding? Right? Is that, was an Old Testament? New, is it even a new, is it a new, like we could get into all, all of that becomes subjective. But what do I know? Is there a clear scripture that says thou shall not nap on Sunday? There should be. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but I'm just saying, wait, everyone could use their arguments, right? I mean, no, nobody even agrees on the Sabbath. Like, some Christians believe the Sabbath is in, a, in effect on Sunday for us, and we have to live by Sabbath rules, right? That you should not be doing any work on it, no entertainment on a Sunday. Okay, okay, okay. No, no, no. Others were like, no, 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 no. The, 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 some would argue it's on a Saturday. Like, we can argue and argue. Like, that, now, that immediately means... Once it becomes a never-ending argument, you got to step back and go, what's clear? Remember, that's what I always say to you. We go back to what is clear. And what is clear? I don't have a specific scripture. I got principles. But see, even when you get to the principles, you see, what, they become very subjective because you're going to apply certain principles and I'm going to be looking at other scriptures that give a different principle and we're going to come to completely different Conclusions. And what's going to motivate you to go your way? Because you lack your nap. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I'm saying in this particular case, you, you guys seem to really like them. Okay? okay y'all, seem, y'all seem to think that there's something glorious about them. Okay? I don't get it. And what's going to motivate me? I don't under, It irritates me. Like when people sleep, I'm like, why are you sleeping? It just literally irritates me, right? I don't get it. I don't know. Like animals, wake up, anything. Just anything I see sleeping, I'm waking up. It doesn't make any sense to me, right? It shouldn't happen. Okay, okay? right? That's why she's always tired at church. Okay, right? like, why are you sleeping? You slept last year. This, it's 2023. 2022 sleep was sufficient, okay? Right? But you get the idea? So what, what motivates that? No, 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 no. What, I'm, you're missing the point. We have our preferences. Preferences seek out principles that support that preference. That becomes subjective. If you don't like something, and, and yeah, don't, don't look at me like this sleep thing. You've done it as parents your whole life. If you don't like something, you find, magically find a way to tell your kid it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right, right, right? You're right, you're right. But I'm just saying, there's a magic way of, isn't it amazing how that works? If you don't like it, it magically becomes wrong. And if you like it, it magically becomes right. Do we not see the, can we all just be honest about how we do things? Oh, kids do it too, but I usually take up for the teenagers. You know how that works, right? Got to have someone who likes me, right? Okay, because I, I don't trust parents. Okay, so I got to I, I trust the teenagers better because now once they get older, then they won't like me. But I got about a brief like, two or three years where I can have some fans or something. Okay, all right. But you get how it works. We all know this is the game we play. It's the game. It's a big game. So what I so all we can ever do, we, what do we have to fall back to when we're trying to discern from a Christian perspective? What is clear? What is clear? What is clear? Right? Now, sometimes I wish it was more clear in my favor. Like everyone knows, everyone in this church who's ever been here knows what is the, what I loathe a particular liquid. I hate alcohol with every ounce of my being. I, if I was an atheist, I would not touch it. I, would, I hate it because of all the destruction I have seen. The destruction and pain and suffering and addiction and, and everything. I mean, we can go all day on the horrible things that alcohol is connected with, right? I loathe it with every ounce of my being. I hate it. And my argument, and my argument has never even really been a biblical one. My argument is just look at the facts, how many alcoholics are there currently in the United States of America? How much sexual assault has occurred because of alcohol? Domestic abuse because of alcohol? How much dr- drunk, drinking and dry? I just, it's like, why take a substance into my body that's going to impair my ability to think rationally when I have a hard enough time thinking rationally when I don't drink? The last thing I need is more impacting my thinking, yes? So I loathe it. I loathe. So guess what I wish I could do? 
Wish I could open the scripture and say, thou shall never touch it. It's kind of hard to do. You know why it's hard to do? Okay, well, first, the, the people at the church of Corinth were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. That means they were using... And did Paul say, don't drink? No. What is Paul, what is Paul do, is condemned in scripture? Drunkenness. So I can't say drunkenness is a sin. Do I wish I could say something else? Yes. I wish, but I can't. I want to. I can go through all the arguments. Well, and I can argue that this, the, the alcohol of that day is different than the alcohol of our day. I can argue that they had less options to drink than we do because everyone knows when I go on a cruise, I drink a million things. Guess what? All of them, I just leave the alcohol out. I get all the mixed drinks in the world, right? There's just no alcohol in it, right? Because, I, because we live in a day where I can do that. The water, we can drink bottled water. We don't... So there, there, it's a different time. I can make arguments, but what, no matter how many arguments I make, what can I not dogmatically assert? That it's wrong. That's, that's what discernment... We have to fall back to what we can specifically say. Now, we can have our preferences. We can have our opinions. But we cannot assert that which isn't all of this, this glorified God, I wish it was the case that I could just say, hey, Bobby, what are you going to do this afternoon? Is that going to glorify God? Now, Bobby may say, well, of course it's going to glorify God. And Mr. Gillett may go in like, that's not glorifying God. Right? You're going to do what? You're going to watch golf? What in the world? That is not glorifying to God, right? Okay, all right, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> but the point, you see, but immediately, like, we could get into, we could get into an argument on what you're going to do in your Sunday afternoon. Well, someone could, be, someone could be over here going, you should go home and have your meal and then spend the day in Bible study. That would be, that would always win the argument, right? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that sound more glorifying to God? So then either that's what we're, you see how it's subjective. So what can I know? I can look to scripture and go, what does the scripture specifically say I can't do when I go home? Well, I know I can't go home and get drunk. I know I can't go home and kill someone. <laughs> right? That's pretty good, right? Okay. In other words, there's specific things. Now, even, even with those things that are listed, there's a good chance we still may violate them. But I do know I can go home and even when I eat or whatever I do, I can't praise and worship and be thankful to God for the things that I have been given. I, that's easy to do, yes? So I just want to show you the subjective nature of it. But before we leave, let's do this. Go to John 17 really quick. Because this is the passage the curriculum gives for this week, or for last week, actually. We're supposed to be starting a new week. John 17. I have no idea why this really, the curriculum took this passage, because to me it just leads to, it, I, it doesn't really accomplish what they want us to accomplish, but okay. But I want you to see something. John chapter 17, yeah, everyone should know this passage. This is sometimes referred to as what? <clears throat> High priestly prayer. This is Jesus praying to the Father. All right, here we go. These words spake Jesus, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this, and that's, that's in a power, powerful verse in verse 2, who's getting eternal life? Those the father has given to the son, and those the father given to the son are those who were elected. Okay, we can go all, all day there, verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now look at verse 4. Jesus says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now stop right here. I want you to look at verse 4 carefully. What does Jesus confess that has occurred in his lifetime on earth? 
He has glorified God. Okay? By finishing the work. Now, but what I want you to know is this. This is what I want you to take away from this. We all know that we should seek to glorify God in everything we do. Yes? And whether we don't know exactly if that means by how I live, we can argue it is. We can argue it's praising and worship God. But I do know this, and you have to know this. We, 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 one, we have a hard time even agreeing on what that means or doesn't mean. But we all know we fall short of it. Because I think we can all agree that every day we spend our life probably more focused on what? Ourselves. We all fall short of it. And, and that is convicting. And we have to do better. But the one thing I do know is that Jesus did glorify the Father. And so what does that tell me? That in my position... I glorify the Father because he has been glorified perfectly by the Son. That's, that's my only hope is I am called to glorify. I will never glorify him anywhere. I, well, no matter how you want to define glorifying him, whether you want to say praise and worship and thanksgiving, do you always praise and worship and thankful to God? Have there times you've been thank, thankful to God, maybe say for a meal, and it's more just your mouth con- saying you're thankful but has nothing to do with your heart? Okay, okay, maybe, maybe. I, I think that's happened to me a few times, right? Okay, right? Or there, that, there's always that failure because you can preach this kind of sermon and make everyone go, man, I need to glorify God more. I need to glorify, I, I can do it. I'm going to do it. And you know you're not going to, you're going to stop glorifying God before you get home in your car. But you know that God has been glorified perfectly in the Son. He glorified him perfectly. He completed all the work. Right? There, if we want to talk about rest, there's the true rest. What's the rest that we have? That all the work has been done on our behalf. That's, our, that's the true Sabbath rest, right? Yes, that's the true Sabbath rest because all the work has been done. There's nothing I have to do for my salvation. It's all been done for me. So if you want to rest today, rest in that, rest in that. That's where your true rest comes from. See, you don't need sleep. See, I just proved my point. No, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. But it is important for us to, to embrace that fact that I, we should glorify God, but we're going to fall short of that. And I, and, I, and, I, and I know my view on discernment leaves a lot of people maybe bothered, but everything else is subjective. And I think we've already demonstrated that. We, there was disagreement here just on whether we take a nap or not. That's one thing. I didn't even get to anything controversial. And already there, people were ready to argue. Okay, right? No, I'm right. Okay, right? But you, ain't it amazing like that one little thing can lead to disagreement? That's a pretty insignificant thing. Well, I know you're like, no, it's not insignificant. But, but you, it is pretty insignificant. And when we get to deeper issues, some people would, 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 some people will tell me that no, the Bible condemns all drinking. Some people would try to argue that. We, we, we just go round and round and round and round. And if nobody can agree, then what do we have to fall back to? So how, how can we say this? Discernment should be based off what? Everyone should be able to say this. Discernment should be based off what? objective understanding of God's word alone. Because everything else is subjective. Now, you couldn't say, but it's subjective in our understanding of God's word. I agree. I do agree. There is a, but there's some things that are, look, you can tell me whether the scriptures clearly condemn something or death. You say, but there are principles. I know, but those principles can become subjective. We can go to what's objectively clear. This is objectively Wrong. Now, you may think something is objectively wrong. You may think the scriptures are, but we can at least, at least it give, look, put it this way. At least now, what are we arguing? We're arguing at least scripture and not some subjective feeling. Correct? We can look here. Like, for example, alcohol. I, I can show you where clearly I can't condemn it because clearly it's there, right? Other things are not even mentioned. And then that's where people try to grab a principle to apply to it. Well, I'm all for that. Here, here, what can we do with a principle? Let's do it this way. What can we do with principles? I think with a principle, what we can say is, look, 
I may not be able to be dogmatic, but here's at least four or five principles that I would ask you to consider in regards to this subject. And then we struggle with how to apply those principles. We struggle with how to apply those principles. Right? Because, and, and, and we have to realize, and, and, what we, and whenever we try to apply principles to others, what should we always do? We should first apply the principles to ourselves and see how consistent we are with said principle. Because it's easy to look at Bobby and say, hey, you're going to be doing that this Sunday? <laughs> Scripture says, be holy as God is holy. So if, if that action is, does not reach God's level of holiness, you shouldn't do it. It's easy for me to tell Bobby that. But then I would have to ask myself, well, what about myself? Because, I mean, if we really try to live that principle out in any meaningful way, we would all, where would we end up, Mr. Goodlett? In a monastery. And, that, and listen, that's why, remember the joke in church history? There was a time in church history that they, they used to joke that there were more Christians in the monastery than there were in the cities. Because they looked to the scriptures and were like, well, then the only way I can pull this off is, is to just get rid of everything and go move into a monastery. Well, at some point, Christians decided that wasn't correct. So then how do we live out? Because some of these principles, I don't know how you live them out. Do you? Meditate on God's word day and night. Desire God's word more than gold, silver, and food. Anybody convicted yet? Right. So, so we, now we preach that and everyone gets convicted. And then we're like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then we know that what happens? We fall short. We fall short. We fall short. We fall short. I'm not saying we shouldn't pursue it, but we sometimes have to acknowledge, how does this work? And I don't always have easy answers, but I know I can go to what God says. Like that, that, that's a, does God tell me what that looks like? To, to, to meditate on God's word day and night? Does he tell me exactly what that looks like? To desire God's word more than food and silver? He doesn't explain what that looks like, does he? He just gives me the principle. How that's played out, I don't know always. So I know what I'm supposed to be striving for. So discernment is just, just I just want you to just really think about discernment since there's a lot of dis- dis- discussion this week about discernment as far as the Asbury uh, revival is concerned. But there really is discussion about, if you think about, every time there's another controversy in Christianity, it really comes down to discernment. What's right? What's wrong? Can you? Can't you? And everyone fights. And sometimes we just got to step back and go, what? What are the, cl- just give me the, f- the facts. What are the clear, objective things? And then everything else, we may have to kind of go, oh, I don't know. And then you may have to make a decision for what? Yourself based off the principles. Sometimes, though, you've got to be very careful making those principles what? Yeah. Laws for everybody else. What, what can we know is a law for everyone else? What is objectively clear in Scripture? Those principles, how they are applied, like love not the world. That's a great principle, isn't it? What does that look like? Where did we end up, Mr. Goodlett? No, I'm just, I just want you to see the struggle because, because that's a good principle. Like, hey, discernment. Is this demonstrating love to the world? Then don't do it. Well, then if take that to its logical conclusion, then what are you going to be doing all day? Right? We went to a basketball game, right, in Dallas. It wasn't a very good basketball game, but we went to it, okay? Right? Now, was that wrong? But the point is, is some would be like, well, you took time and money to go watch a basketball game where you're glorifying men instead of glorifying God. Uh, that, was, you, that was a waste of time, money, and effort. You could have been spending time evangelizing. You could have been t- spend time, and you can, hear, you, you can hear those kinds of discussions. Right? You could have given that money to a, a, a ministry. I mean, Mr. Gillick could have given more money to the church, right? I mean, you know, like we, we could make all kinds of arguments, right? You see how that works? That's, that's hard how to figure that out. All right, we'll stop. Look, we come before you this afternoon. Lord, we have more questions than we do have answers, but we are grateful that you and your son glorified one another 
and that that glory is imputed to us so that we can say that we have glorified you perfectly. We are thankful that your son completed the work because we fall short of it continually. Help us think about discernment in a more biblical way and not such an emotional, subjective way so that we can think more clearly on about very difficult and controversial issues. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said...